My father was a great American comedian uh, who the English would know as the Cowardly Lion and the Wizard of Oz. But for 50 years, he was a star on Broadway and was premiered waiting, uh, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot uh, on Broadway. So a significant figure. And I wrote a bio, my first book was a biography of him. It took five years. And at the end of it, I, did, I came to the conclusion that the, the source of great comedy was revenge. The most famous thing about Orton in the English culture at that time was his death. It was a sensational murder and their pictures were everywhere. But his plays, I mean, his great masterpiece, What the Butler Saw, had been panned. It was uh, when it first opened. Um, and there was no, absolutely no interest in the, among English publishers to publish the diaries. None. <laughs> Go on then, get back on your beat. I say, do you two always do everything together? Yeah, we're a double act. <laughs> I like to see him enjoy himself. Oh, I got a son at home your age. Oh, bring him along next time, we'll have a foursome. <laughs> yeah, nice. Close the door behind you, love. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever read a copper. The diary entry was about ha uh, Hallowell told him that he was reading the paper and said he was ta talking about the living theater and how people were screwing on stage. And Orton said, wrote down, much more fucking and they'll be screaming hysterics in next to no time. And that sentence was like a dog whistle to me because what Orton was thinking was that he wanted to drive the audience crazy with both terror and elation. That was, that is the comic impulse. And as if almost magically, the end of what the butler saw, the missing part of Sir Winston Churchill, is actually a penis. Now, and which is waved over the, the stage like a wand. Now, in, when we think of the Shakespearean fool, the fool is carrying a scepter, right? Now that scepter, was actually a penis, originally. And the idea, the comic impulse, is to put it to the audience, to take them for a tumble, to really roger them, you know, to, to, to drive them. And so it instinctively was in Orton's, the, the phallic fun was very much part of Orton in every way, it was aggressive. It was sexy. It was terrible. All those, all those complicated and, and contrasting feelings were, were part of what his comedy was doing, what he was doing, and what he saw. Orton actually had written, far, way before he was able to write plays, he had written about creating a seismic disturbance. He had written about firing, if, if you could find the right words, he said, and fire them at an audience, it would, ha it would be capable of killing centuries afterwards. So he was talking about symbolically murdering stereotypes and ideas. That's where his head was. This was revenge. And in my view, when I read this, I saw, I, I saw this was a man who t was taking the clown's instincts, my father's instincts, and transferring them from the stage to the page. This was unique. Nobody had done that before. Peggy Ramsey wanted me to have the diaries. I rented them, so to speak, for the time I was writing the book in order to make a case for Orton as a playwright because there was no case he had been written off largely, and so that the, the there was a revival at Royal Court of all three major plays in 1975, which featured especially Lindsay Anderson's uh, really outstanding production of What the Butler Saw, which put it, you know, in its proper place. And then my book came out, um, and you can see 
from just reading the royalty statements that it had. The book was a, 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 a big success, and as a consequence, there was a great deal of interest in Orton, and Orton subsequently is on the syllabus. But you can see from his royalty statements that, you know, he went from zero to quite substantial amounts of money, so that there was, it, it, and it, it, it put him, it did the job of criticism, which was to launch him into the culture in the context of his life and, this, and sort of make a case for stylistically how to approach these very unique, uh, this unique sensibility, which was both playing with classical forms and structures in terms of language, but also bringing a pop culture and uh, the collision of pop and uh, classic. What Orton's mission is for himself and for the culture is to make people think. I mean, the first words of loot are Orton's mission. Wake up, stop dreaming. That's it. That's the story. That's what he does. He wants to disabuse people of their received opinion. and disenchant them because only the disenchanted are free and what he's and that is the the notion that is the sort of essential psychological anarchy that his comedy is up to loot is a parody of the detective form on the one hand uh, and at the time of or near the time of the writing there was a, a, a famous inquiry into the uh, police force, or the Challoner inquiry, about this rogue detective who, you know, was shaking down people and essentially abusing his power, and that sort of inspired the idea of a farce. Uh, you know, what Orton is attacking here is uh, the, uh, the public's credulity and their uh, willing to, willingness to submit to authority without questioning it, you know. You want to watch it there, making false accusations against members of the water board. <laughs> you know, you know. I... If I hear you accuse us again of using violence against the suspects, I'll take you down to the station and kick your eyes through the back of your head. <clears throat> oh, ah. <laughs> Young gentleman overbalanced this. Well now, are we ready? He's trying to show the audience their own irrationality and their own credulity to a certain degree and teasing that and, every, and, and physically, the idea of, of having your mother upside down in a closet in a casket when she's dead. Why do we care? What, what is the mourning? What is a mourning ritual? What is the sort of the ritual of burial supposed to, to be about? It's, it's sort of he's asking, he's, he's trying to shock and he says, uh, an audience into thinking about the world, their assumptions, and why they hold them, you know. But I mean, we, we were at Bournemouth, and um, one usherette was reported as saying that it was unnecessarily filthy, as if there really was a necessary amount of filth. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, people used to walk out, at Bournemouth this was, and sometimes you couldn't hear the dialogue for the slamming of the seat. In the case of Lute, he has essentially, like in Entertaining Mr. Sloan, it's a negotiation which, which ends in the, what is perceived to be bad, getting away with it. They, they, their barbarity, their cruelty, their evil, uh, is hidden behind a masquerade of propriety. And I think he's trying to make, that's the joke. That's also, the re, for Orton, the reality. And that's what the plays dramatize, you know. Because of the success of entertaining Mr. Sloan, they rushed Loot into an early first production because uh, somewhere in the middle of the writing, Orton met Kenneth Williams, the beloved English carry-on uh, comedian, uh, and they 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 were and remained friends, 
uh, they instant friends. And Williams was a very bright, lonely, uh, tortured, solitary figure. He loved Wharton's humor and charm, and he was prepared to tolerate Hallowell. And they they became good friends, but. Wharton, the, the play, which begins about Faye uh, and the nurse, who, and the nurse is going to try to essentially marry and uh, McCleavy for his money. The play starts with Faye, and then she gets lost by the second act because it's then that, to a certain extent, Wharton had met Williams, and the play becomes, he starts to write the play and shift the emphasis on the detective, the kind of mad uh, D Truscott of the yard. The play was just not, it was an impulse that was not there. It should never have, it should never have been mounted at that time. It was a disaster. You'll be blacklisted. I'll see you never get another nursing job again. No, 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 sir, don't let's be vindictive. Show a little tolerance, please. Phyllis, perhaps you'd be kind enough to make us uh, a cup of tea. And it was directed in London by an American called Charles Maravitz, who a director that Orton did not particularly like. Uh, but And Maravitz said he wanted to go back to the original script and start there. But And Orton gave him, not the original script, he, but he, he gave him the, the Manchester script and said it was the original. And that was the, that was the, that was the the big watershed moment because the 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 product the London production directed by Maravitz was a big hit. Uh, Orton won the Evening Standard Prize, and he was suddenly a a public figure, much in demand, and certain now with two big hits behind him of a of a substantial uh, literary. A, a theatrical uh, career, and that's when he starts his diary. He starts his diary when he thinks he's going to have a life of of some interest. He's being asked to parties. The Beatles are calling him up, looking for a script. He's hot, uh, and of course, the celebrity, the interest, takes him not only out into the world and away from Hallowell, but it exacerbates the reality of their lives, that Orton had uh, now outperformed and outpaced his tutor. He was able to, he was, he had now, he was now educated. He could now see that the man that he thought was so well informed, wasn't. What did happen to him and what was happening was that he was being pulled into a very attractive uh, situations, productions, people wanting to know him. He would take Hallowell, but Hallowell's, Hallowell's envy and, and his frustration uh, inevitably uh, made him harder to be around or to want to be around. He was depressed. He wanted Joe for himself. He wanted to keep the life that they had had prior to Orton's success. And at the same time, because he was so envious, he spoiled the success when it was happening. He'd throw scenes. He'd be difficult. Uh, you know, it was, it was extremely hard. And it seems to me, I, and this is a thought that came to me way after I wrote the book. I think I, this is one point. The book was, you know, a huge success. It was made into a movie, and I, I think it probably, I think it probably sold between, between three and five hundred thousand copies. I, I don't really know, but it sold a lot of copies. But what I, what I, I think, that, and of course, the diaries, which I used to tell his story were a, a large part of the reason the book's success, because they're extremely well-written and funny and very specific. I actually don't think that there's a, a better document about the 60s 
because it was high and low. You saw the underbelly of English life as well as the 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 the, uh, the glitterati in it. But that said, when Orton wrote those diaries, he wrote them at a desk. And then he would go out and he would leave the diaries in the desk unlocked. I now think that that was intentional. And had I a chance to rewrite the book, which I don't, I would use that more dramatically because I think it was a way of trying to tell Hallowell he wanted out. He wanted to go and to force him. Now, when Hallowell murdered Orton, nine blows to the forehead. He, he, in other words, he beat out the very thing. He killed the thing he'd educated, that he envied, that he didn't have. He'd made something that had outpaced him. Now, he left a note which says, which says the diaries will explain everything. And the frustrating thing is, that they don't quite explain everything, uh, except the diaries themselves may be the thing that explains everything, that, that this life itself and the, the, the very fact that Orton was sort of taunting him in a way by keeping an account of his scenes as well as Orton's success, it was Either way, he read them. It was a humiliation, you know, that I don't think Orton expected Hallowell to kill him, but I definitely think he was trying to tell him something, you know. Uh, I, 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 I think that's, I think that now, 30 years later.